Hey, welcome here. Welcome to Seismic Radio and uh, another talk here on Seismic Radio on the big subject of prepping, you know, uh, how far to go for prepping and how to prepare for a disaster. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, I've done a few talks on this, on this uh, line again, but I, I revisited the whole thing. I felt a sense of urgency. And uh, so here's the talk. And, and, and it's a big thing as well. There are, there are obviously there are two things uh, I have to, before I go any further, and it gives you a chance to switch off if you, or, you know, to turn off if you don't want to listen to it. <clears throat> That's fair. But uh, I'm a Christian and I look at it from a Christian perspective. I know that the times we are in are very difficult times. And the Bible uh, mentions that the times are ahead are, uh, potentially the worst times that have ever been. And so, um, and we've got something preceding these times and, and the Bible calls them birth pangs. Yeah. So the, uh, it's similar to a woman giving birth. So <clears throat> the, um, the birth pains, they set in and, uh, they become stronger and stronger and the intervals become shorter and shorter. And I think that's pretty much what we have witnessed for the last 20 years. And, um, and we got like, crazier and crazier times <clears throat> okay so obviously you you can get get, a, get caught up in these birth birth pains which are which are happening right now and where we where we can witness disasters which are going worse and worse uh, the closer we get to uh, to the final time before before it all kicks off okay so what can we do how far should we go should we go absolutely berserk and uh, and uh, you know as you can see in some of those prepper films from the States where people have got like, um, you know, whole basements filled with food. And, and if, you know, the world comes to literally comes to an end, they could, they could, uh, they could dig out and they could, you know, dig in and they could, um, survive for the next two, three years without, without a great loss in their, their comforts or food or they could sustain themselves. And, um, but the thing is, um, if wherever you are, if it gets flooded, if wherever you are gets destroyed, or if wherever you are, you get like some marauding gangs to come in and steal everything you have. So it's all for nothing. So um, before I go any further, the, the big thing is you need to be in a relationship with God. You need to know where you stand with God and you need to be very careful to listen to the prompting of God, to be guided by the Holy Spirit in, in what you do, how far you go. And... Um, and also, I mean, number one is that you don't waste all your, your whole potential energy and everything else on just preparing for a disaster, which you may not be able to fend against anyway. Or um, you find yourself, uh, the other extreme, completely and utterly unprepared. And so the disaster comes and even though God has been prompting you and told you to do X, Y, Z, you know, prepare yourself, you know, have some extra food, have, you know, move to a different location, you know, have like maybe food or water at a different location as well. So I, I don't know, you need to to really be open to, to God. If you're not a Christian and you're an, an agnostic or you think this is all crazy, I don't want to deal with that, listen to the talk. There, I'm sure there are some things you may pick up if you have thought about this, which is probably the reason why you are listening to this presentation in the first place. Um, you will have done something about it and you will have some of the things for your disaster preparation. But... Um, um, but maybe you find a few things which, you know, where you haven't done enough. Uh, one thing I thought about today, and I don't think it's in the presentation, you need a can opener. You know, if your electricity doesn't go and <laughs> nothing works and you've got plenty of guns, you don't have a can opener. It's a nightmare to use tools or to use knives or whatever to try to open a can. Just a simple mechanical can opener, ideally two. I've got one and I don't know where I've got it. It's an old German army can opener. And it's really, really good. It's absolutely good. But there's virtually no mechanics. There's no moving parts or anything in there. You just stick it in the can and you've got certain, certain leverage and you can just open your can. And, and uh, I'm not sure where I've placed it. I, I need to look for it. But it was one of the best can openers I ever had. And uh, to be fair, you know, I've got how many homes have I got? Um, obviously, I've got the one where I live in permanently. And then uh, um, um, I've got a home in, in Germany, so I'm in England, I'm, I've got one in, in Germany, and, and there I couldn't find a can opener. It was really, really bizarre when I tried to make some food. And it kind of dawned on me how easy it is to just forget about these things and, um, you know, for them to no longer be there. Um, so anyway, go for it. Have a look at this talk and uh, I'll sort of try to go through it quickly. 
uh, hopefully it, it'll, it'll help you in your preparation. Okay, do I need to be prepared? This is the first story and I've, I've just got some personal stories. I've got links to the Ukraine and uh, I've got Dima's story. Dima, uh, a doctor working in the uh, Ukraine, he's got a, a wife and two kids. Um, he's about probably in his 40s <clears throat> and, um, and anyway, went to work and obviously, you know, the Ukraine war. And it was one of those things nobody expected it to take place. Nobody expected uh, the Russian army to cross the border and to, to start a full-blown war. And, uh, and when it happened, uh, Dima was sort of caught up in it. He was still working and probably his services were more in need than ever before as he was working in a hospital, you know, fixing up people and, um, and working on, uh, you know, people who got injured, you, you know, through the war, through the bomb bombardment which took place in Mariupol. Anyway, I met, I met this guy a few weeks ago and he told me his story. Uh, so he got a wife, he got two young kids and um, uh, and then one day, you know, as he was at work, his kids were, I presume at school um, or in a bunker somewhere. Anyway, his house got hit and he lost everything. So he came home from work and there was nothing left. Um, uh, I've put up a picture here on the PowerPoint presentation. It, it wasn't the picture he has sent me, but it pretty much... Or he's shown me, but it pretty much looked very close. It got a direct hit, everything got burned out. He lost everything, absolutely everything. So all he had were the clothes on his back. He didn't even have a pair, um, a spare pair of shoes. Same with his wife and his kids. Um, his car was hit as well. He had a car there. And he, he uh, they then escaped. Um, but when, when they could get out of Mariupol, it was under Russian control. So they could only move within the... The Russian con controlled areas they couldn't control across back in the Ukraine and and he showed me his car his car all the windows were through the the blast waves all the windows were um, were blown out and uh, and he just uh, got a um, uh, a windscreen from another car and he he used um, uh, what's it called in, in in England we call it gaffer tape um, duct tape i think it's called duct tape in american so he used a bunch of duct tape um um gaffer tape as we call it here and and he he just taped the the windscreen on whatever was left on his own win, on his old windscreen because it didn't fit it wasn't uh, an original fit and then he used this to escape mariupol and to go to a different part and then later he um uh, he escaped through russia and and he ended up in germany Charlie's story, again, Charlie, a uh, former boss of mine, and his wife is from Mariupol, and he got caught up in it. Both of them got caught up in, in this. He tried to get out when it started to look a bit uh, iffy, and he didn't manage to get out. And he was um, he was stuck there for, uh, for several weeks in the midst of winter, minus 10 degrees, no heating, no electricity, no water, no gas, yeah, nothing. Yeah. And uh, and they were under constant bombardment. Um, they they made it out. They survived it. Uh, again, they he came back to England and he uh, he was here now. But absolute horror story uh, from what he went through. Uh, one statement he told me is he saw things which no human should have ever seen. Um, I leave this to your imagination. What this um, means is is um, uh, the apartment where he stayed and didn't have a direct hit. Uh, as far as I know, but um, but they just just made it out. They just survived it. Um, again, so it, it's just uh, you know he tried to get out before when it when it started looking a bit iffy. I don't know how much preparedness they they had and you know how he could cope with water and food and and just to keep himself going. But it was sort of um, you know survival story really to uh, to get through. Elena is another story, uh, a lady very close to my heart, and she, she just got out with um, four cats, a dog, and a parrot, uh, and her son and her um, daughter-in-law, um, just the day before it started. I think it was the last commercial train, literally the last commercial train they, they, they could get to, to leave Mariupol. After that, there were two refugee trains, then the train lines got hit, and, and there was it. People were, were stuck there, they couldn't escape anymore. And um, and she just got out, uh, but but it was the thing as well. She um, she could only carry, um, you know, one suitcase literally, and most of the stuff that was in there was just to maintain the the welfare of the the animals, the pets. Um, she made it to Germany, and um, 
by a Poland, and it was just a horrendous story again to 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 look at this. But but this was all a last minute decision. I I remember when she was talking about this, her son got some tickets, and uh, they were looking, and they said, "Shall we go?" Because at this point, nobody knew are the Russians coming across or not. Um, so they they got some tickets. They they left the town, and uh, and as they were leaving, just um, just before the train turned towards um, towards the west. Uh, it stopped, and there was a lot of bombing and shooting, and they didn't know whether uh, that was the end of the journey. You know, they were going to get caught up in the war, or maybe even the train was going to get hit. Um, another story I always use, and I've mentioned it before, and it was just, uh, and this is sort of just everyday life. You know, I live in a in an area which is uh, fortunately not uh, plighted by war as yet, um, <clears throat> and. Um, and uh, but there was one winter where we had a lot of snow and uh, snow doesn't happen very often over the last sort of 10 to 20 years. So councils have only got minimum provision to to deal with uh, a huge amount of snow. And then there was a transformer which blew up. Yeah, I um, I was outside and I still saw it and there was like a, a flush you know, on the hill and it was just a transformer that had, that had gone, that had blown up. Um, when I got home, there was no power. Everything was left, and and I tried to go to town uh, to because I thought this the, the roads were full of snow. No car was getting through, and I thought, you know, here we go. It's going to be quite uh, going to be problematic. So I thought better get some provisions in, and so I wanted to go to to town. And, and one of my neighbors came up town, you know, uh, stumping through the snow, and he he told me and he said, uh, no point going to town. Everything has been sold out. All the shops are empty. Uh, so anyway, I, I thought, okay, I have to, you know, if nothing else, at least see what is going on. And I was prepared. I had sort of stuff in my house, so I, I would have been okay. Uh, and I was about to, you know, get ready and, and everything like that. But I thought, let's go down, have a look, see what it was. And, and true enough, all milk and bread had gone. Uh, but there were still some um, some bits you could get, uh, canned food, sweets, you know, cornflakes and things like that. So I made sure I had enough to eat and uh, had enough fresh food and uh, came back home and uh, and then I I got ready, you know, so uh, bearing in mind no electricity, no central eating. But I still had uh, some fires which were fed by uh, by the, the gas pipes directly. And um, and I didn't need any electricity to keep them going. Uh, so it was just purely pure gas fires. So I um, I was ready to turn on the gas fires to, to try and keep warm. Uh, and I got all my equipment ready to, to dig in and um, to be ready for the next three, four days until, you know, the electricity board would, would be able to get to the transformer, providing the snow was cleared and so on. But uh, as, as it went, uh, I think they managed to... Um, to sort it pretty quickly, so before the night set in, electricity came back on and everything was okay. But it just makes you realize that you don't need to be in a, um, uh, I think they call it the SHTF event, um, like a really bad event for uh, your prepping to kick in and to be to, to become of use. Yeah. Um, there were there was another scenario as well, and we're gonna gonna look at this uh, rivers bursting banks. We had this in Germany a couple of years ago, um, where um, a lot of houses were washed away, and it came out of the blue, and it was just some rivers, some localized heavy rainfall, some rivers burst the banks, and houses were swept away. It's quite quite traumatic. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make is, uh, it's important to to think about you know what could happen. And what do I need to try to survive? And there's the, the one where you need to escape quickly and you have to leave everything behind. So you have to get the documents, insurance documents, passport, uh, bank cards, bank documents, cash uh, or whatever to, to, to try to get away. Yeah, and possibly, you know, a spare set of clothes, um, toothbrush, some hygiene products. If you are a lady, you know, lady products and so on. Um, to, to just allow you to get away and so to uh, that you can go to a hotel or to friends or whatever to uh, to dig out and to, to spend a couple of nights there. And, and, and there will be situations or p potentially could be situations where you've only got minutes to get out yeah, and to get ready. And then this could be a lightning strike. It could be a fire. It could be um, uh, it could be. Um, uh, a natural event, a natural disaster, it could be an act of war, uh, which will not give you allow you much time, and you you need to make sure that all the the most important stuff you've got with you, 
and then obviously the the whole prepping thing you know having like uh 500 cans of food or something it's, it's not going to do you any good when when this happens but you need to be able to to be on the move okay let's go through this so we've got the new reality which you will be confronted with and the new reality could consist that you've got no electricity yeah uh, you may still have water you may still have heat but um but again, gas pumps and uh, water pumps are uh, all over the place. Uh, and to get water, if electricity is off for long enough, your water supply is gonna gonna suffer as well. It's not just gravity fed, uh, but uh, somewhere down the line, there are gonna be pumps to, to pump the water. So if your electricity goes down, uh, it's only a question of time until you've got no water. So this, it's important as well, bear this in mind. So if if you've got a, an electricity outage, which is likely to last some time, um, make sure you have got plenty of empty vessels, a bathtub or whatever, which you can fill up with water so that you, you'll be okay for, for fresh water. Okay, no telecoms as well. So we've got no heat. If the gas goes, you know, what you're going to do? We've got no telecommunications, so no internet, no, uh, you can't, you know, phone your neighbors. Uh, bearing in mind that the old telephone system, which was very resilient, and disaster proof and probably the last thing to go down it doesn't exist anymore in some parts of the country some parts of the world it's all done with uh, via the internet so if the internet goes down then your normal you know your old phone lines may go down as well so it's just just something to bear, bear in mind i had this <clears throat> in one instance where we had like a lot of rain here in um, where i live in england and apparently a server farm got flooded and um, I had no internet for for quite some time, for about half a month, month or a month. Just, just nothing. It wasn't, <clears throat> wasn't there. And um, at that time, you still had separate phone lines and things like that. So I, I could call for help and I think I had mobile phones as well at the time. But um, but it can happen, you know, it can happen. And um, your telecoms may go, go completely out of the window. So how do you communicate with... Uh, your friends with your neighbors um, you know when if you need help how do you how do you make yourself known it's quite quite an important question there are a couple of things you can do which are not very expensive um, and it's it's maybe something to bear in mind we're going to look at this in a minute there's no light okay so <clears throat> when it gets dark it gets dark have you got candles have you got batteries have you got solar which in summer is okay and you've got short nights but in winter time a uh, different story um, no warm food as well you know, which could be a great comfort if you have a warm meal once a day or something and and you could have no smartphone so even though your smartphone works if if the um, the towers uh, are out of action <clears throat> you will not get any connectivity so it's something to bear in mind and you need to think around it you know what can we do how can i protect myself and there i mean i'm not sort of trying to get you into going to extremes but um, you can do simple steps to try and alleviate some of those disasters and to have a little bit of a resilience and uh, redundancy. Okay. Uh, next one, how to prepare, uh, assuming you still have a home. So that's really what this talk is about. Uh, I want to make another talk as well. You know, if you've just got, you know, you have to evacuate your home and you have to escape. What, what can you do? Okay. So, um, first of all, you, uh, you need to have, uh, warm clothing, maybe a winter sleeping bag, especially in winter time, and some of them are really, really good. Uh, so you can have minus umpteen degrees in the house, um, and uh, and it'll keep you warm. So winter sleeping bag is important. Uh, there are these survival sheets as well, which you find in uh, first aid kits and things like that. You can buy them separately. They actually work really well, and it might be worthwhile to invest into. And they're not very expensive. They're just a few pounds here and there. Uh, when you go on eBay or Amazon or something, but it might be might be an idea to invest in a few of them. Uh, I find if you uh, if you unfold them and you you got like these really tiny parcels where these survival sheets are in these um, this is reflective material. Um, I find if you unfold them, you never get them back into this little pouch they come in. So uh, just bear this in mind. But again, if if you're in the house, you can. It doesn't really matter how small you get it. You can fold it up and put it into a small bag or something, but they, they do work. The other thing as well is, and, and this is sort of a pound shop thing or a dollar shop where you can go to a dollar shop and you can get like lots of batteries and, and possibly torches as well. Um, and 
also if you've got a radio, a light, a laptop, candles and so on. So kit yourself out, you know, maybe just spend like 10 quid on batteries. So you've got plenty of them. Uh, they've got a shelf life as well. So if you keep them for uh, four or five years, some of those batteries they will be empty. So it's just something to bear in mind if you go down this route. <clears throat> so um, you have to do this every couple of years and um, or use those batteries up and replace them with new ones. But uh, get plenty of batteries as well. So you've got like torches. Torches are very important if you go around, especially when it's dark at night. Uh, also, when you've got like unsavory characters roaming around uh, looking for what they can steal or what they can rob. Um, bearing in mind that, that when you've got a, a really bad, um, let me use this term again, this SH, SHFT event. Um, you will find that after a few days, there could be anarchy breaking out, especially if you haven't got a community that's uh, going to nip it in the butt. Uh, you need rechargeable batteries as well, ideally, which and, and um, solar panels if you have uh, to, to charge them up. Candles, good idea. They, they keep warm. There are a couple of tricks as well. When you have a candle, you can um, use it for generating light and if it's in winter time a candle can give you quite significant amount of warmth as well so um, uh, there are some some things where you can put like an old uh, can you know like a conserve an empty can and you can put it on top of the candle you can heat up this gun and the the can will be a radiator so that the the heat doesn't just puff away straight away but it gets absorbed in a little bit of metal and then radiates it out so it can be a, a source of warmth as well uh, make sure you've got uh, your laptop charged up, um, radios as well. Uh, I think I'm going to talk about this. I've got a, a crank radio, which you can crank up, uh, bearing in mind that uh, as a human being, you don't have much power when, you, uh, when you've got these crank generators and you do it with your hands. Uh, it's just a couple of watts you have, but it's enough, you know, if everything goes to just keep yourself a little bit entertained and to listen to, to news as well, to try and find out what's going on if radio stations still work. Uh, they do have lots of backups, um, the battery backups and so on. So they are prepared for these scenarios. They've got generators as well. So there's a good chance that you will get some radio stations which are still operable um, when, when you've got a bad event to, to keep the people mobilized as well. Okay, so anyway, batteries for torches, radio, for light, maybe for your laptop as well, a spare battery or something. Candles, good idea. Solar panels, rechargeable battery, fuel generator, and spare fuel. So um, you can buy sort of for about 10, 15 pounds, uh, 10 watt solar panels. On a good day, they will give you about four or five watts, but um, it's one one chance to top up your batteries. If you've got batteries, you get like a charge controller with some of them as well. So if you've got like a leisure battery or a car battery or something, you can charge them up with that. And keep them topped up um, and it, it kind of does work i tried it out i got like a very um a tv set that was uh quite high on power consumption and if you've got like a, a an inverter yeah which gives you 240 volts and you hook it up to to one of these systems they, they will last about um they will last about um a um, couple of hours or something, you can watch TV, but obviously if you don't use TV, but you just use your radio, it'll last for a very, very long time, sort of 20, 30 hours or something. You get to light as well. So if you keep everything sort of running on a minimum, it'll keep you going for quite some time. And uh, per day, you can maybe have uh, in winter time, so you're looking maybe at about sort of four or five hours of sunlight if, if you're lucky. Um, five watts maybe so you get about 25 watt hours um which might be enough to charge up your uh, batteries if you've got a fuel generator even better uh so when you keep the thing running so it doesn't really matter uh, if you run it for an hour it's about a couple of liters of fuel for a couple of hours um and it doesn't really matter whether you you load it up quite heavy or or less so the fuel consumption doesn't go that much higher so you know ideally everything you have charge it up and uh, charge up all your batteries and then um, uh, you can have power for the rest of the day okay next one is food food very very important so you need dried food pasta rice porridge oats 
Uh, I said dry food twice here. Okay, cornflakes, stuff like that. Canned food as well, especially for fruit and meats. Uh, so you get your proteins from there. Uh, so very important. Try to make sure that you've got at least a month's supply. Um, the, the stuff you hear on uh, on a lot of prepper channels is, and which is probably true, that most families, um, they are 12 meals away from starvation. So that's sort of the average family. So if you imagine, you know, electricity goes, there's no more, um, you know, shops are closed, nothing is happening, they're empty, the su supply chains are breaking down. Uh, and we have seen in COVID what it means if supply chains break down. So you're looking at, um, um, in average, for the average household, you're looking at about um, a week, maybe, yeah, maybe three, four days, and then they've run out of food. You should try to make sure that um, you've got a buffer of about a month to two or three months yeah, to, to have enough food in the house, if you can. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be top top end stuff. You can, uh, to be fair, you know, the average human being can live without food for about a month. They say it's not not a good time and it's not easy. Um, but if you want to sort of carry on living on a minimum, make sure you've got some stuff there. And I tell you one thing: if you're hungry, everything tastes uh, tastes great. Okay, uh, hygiene products very important. So um, let me just take the mouse where I am. So hygiene products: soap, toothpaste, shampoo, um, toilet paper. And then ladies' products as well. Yeah, make make sure you've got them and you've got them uh, in uh, in reserve as well. It's sort of not just on you know circulation, but you've got enough to keep you for a couple of months or something. Um, okay, dried milk, long life milk, concentrated juice, squash as well. So that might be good. Then important is get a water filter because if your water your water is gonna you don't realize how much water we use on a daily basis. So if your water supply doesn't work anymore uh, and you have to capture rainwater um, or get water from wherever so it's important to have some means of filtering and to, to to catch water also means to transport water as well try to make sure you've got some sort of tank like a 50 liter tank or something and then um, uh, there are some ways of water filtration which you can make yourself but again how, how do you get this stuff in a in a bad event uh, in Africa they use like um, buckets where you put water on top and you've got a layer of sand, a layer of coal, and then uh, another layer of sand, and they, they try to filter the water that way, and it seems to work to some, some extent. Uh, water purification tablets, very important. Um, then think about medicines as well, um, which you may need, so uh, like painkillers, medicines you need for yourself, that you've got, got a stash of reserve as well to keep you going for a couple of months in case you can't get um, you can't get uh, current medicine, so you can't get to the doctor. I remember um, that during COVID times, we think, you know, the doctor's practice might be very important. It was actually closed. Yeah. It was really, really bizarre. But uh, when COVID was at its peak, they, they just closed the practice. No people coming in. Uh, very, very strange. So if you need medication, make sure you've got like a spare stash, especially if it's, you know, important stuff for your heart or your blood pressure or whatever. You don't want to risk it to, to go out of control. Uh, food supplements as well. Vitamin pills, um, very important. Um, then antihistamines maybe, uh, iodine in case there's a nuclear attack or, or something like that. Make sure you've got a first aid kit, kit as well. Um, make sure you've got a working fire extinguisher. And as I'm talking to you, I know I've got one here, but I, I don't know whether it actually... I bought it many, many years ago, so I don't know whether it actually works. It should be checked every couple of years, but... Um, it doesn't do you any harm to, to get like a, a fire extinguisher, maybe a spare one uh, there, maybe one for each floor, just to make sure that everything is okay. A camping cooker as well, uh, fuel and stove for wood. So camping cooker, you know, important, but you need fuel as well. If you have got a wood stove, um, that's great as well. Make sure you've got some wood. Uh, and in most cases, you can get some wood, you can collect it. Uh, matches and cigarette lighter. If you don't smoke, it's um, it's so easy to not have any cigarette lighter or any matches anywhere. and uh, Or matches are so old that they don't work anymore. And, and this is something maybe to, to make sure that you've got something there, bearing in mind, like I don't smoke and um, I, I uh, needed a, a light some time ago. I don't know whether it was for a candle or whatever, but 
um, I couldn't find any anything anywhere because I just just don't use them. Yeah. So it was a reminder for me to you know go to the pound store and the dollar store and um, uh, get a bunch of them yeah, and have them ready just in case you need them. Um, pet food as well if you've got pets, uh, litter, pet care products. So make sure you've got like a, um, uh, enough to keep you going for a couple of months. Yeah. So I think it's very important. It's, I mean, obviously it's bad if your animal suffers because of uh, a bad event which is, is taking place. Okay, so moving on. Communications are very important as well. Something goes wrong. You need to possibly call the emergency services. They might be overloaded anyway and not much is happening. You need to call for help. How do you do this? You know, if your smartphone doesn't work anymore, if your landline doesn't work. So one of them is, is um, one thing you need to do is, is to diversify with your communications. Uh, I, I used to do this with the internet. I'm using... Um, um, I'm using um, um, basically the mobile network for my internet provision. And um, I use one company and they give me unlimited internet. Um, so I use them for, for all my internet needs. Um, but every now and then they went down and I was without internet. So at one stage I, I needed a second internet as well for, um, uh, for some friends I had came over to stay for some time. And, um, and I made the mistake I used um, um, because I was happy with the company for, for most of it. So I used the same company. So I had two SIM cards from the same company. But the problem obviously was if, if one internet connection went down, uh, the other one went down as well. So I thought, right, I need to change this. So I, I got rid of, the con of one of the contracts and I got a, another contract with a phone company who I knew was using a different infrastructure. So when you go to um, to the wireless um, um, to uh, to obviously it can be with a company as well, but very often it's the infrastructure that's that's a problem. So if you use with cell phone companies, there are normally three different um, um, type of networks, and most companies are just piggy bugging on one of those three networks. Uh, here in England, we have got uh, one which is at 900 megahertz and one at 1.8 megahertz, uh, at 1,800 megahertz, and the one at 2,100 megahertz. Three, I know, is at, as far as I know, at 2,100. Uh, then you've got, uh, I think, Vodafone and O2 is, is on one, and then there there's another one, used to be, um, not sure what the companies are called now, but they use 1.8 gigahertz, yeah. And uh, so what I made sure now is I've got one which, you know, the phone company I've been with for a long time and they seem to be okay. And then I've got one at 900 megahertz as well, sort of at the lower frequencies. And um, and it works really well. So if, if one when one fails, very often the other one is still okay. Um, and, and later on I got like a, th a third provider as well. And uh, the third provider actually is very flaky. And I'm sort of thinking getting rid of this. So that's one thing, so diversify. So one thing you could do is, is just... Uh, you know, get some SIM cards from different phone companies and try to find out what network they are using. And um, not not that you've got just one network infrastructure and everything you have is just piggybugging on this on this one network infrastructure, but make sure that they are different ones. And this is different for every country, wherever you are, wherever you're listening. Okay, I think you got the point. So in my scenario, I've got uh, um, um, about, I'm just trying to think, I've got three different phones and then I've, in addition to that I've got two more which I could use for phones as well but they are on different networks so if it came to a clash I've got some very simple old type mobile phones the 2G stuff um, I've got uh, sort of two of those on different networks I've got um, uh, one phone which I use all the time on one network and then I've got some SIM cards and some other smartphones as well, which I normally don't use. So um, if connections go down here, I'm reasonably well prepared. I haven't got a landline though, so that would, would work. But I've got lots of other stuff to try and hopefully compensate for that. So from your perspective, I would I would try and get a landline, try and get um, um, you know some smartphones, also try to get some really old um, mobile phones uh, the old style ones, the 2G ones, you know, the, the I'm not sure the non-smart ones, 
and um, and what you find is the batteries might last a lot longer and they might they might work really well and um, uh, and that's in the end what you want I mean my phone about after a day the battery is empty I need to charge it if I can't charge it I'm um, in a difficult position. Also get power packs for your phones as well. Uh, they cost about uh, 10 pounds to 20 pounds here. So maybe about 10 to 20 dollars where, where you are, um, 15 euros or whatever. So try to get hold of a couple of power banks. Sometimes you get them on offer. Uh, just get them, keep them charged up and leave them somewhere. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a downside to it. They, if you get the really cheap ones, they can blow up and they can uh, give you more problems and solutions <coughs> okay next what um, should you get uh, radio with a crank I talked about this earlier uh, and solar uh, what I found with these radios is I've got a couple of them and I tested them you know the crankshaft radios uh, so-called survival radios and uh, they don't the solar side of it is just a joke it's just really to top up the battery so if you keep him somewhere keep him in the sun you can make sure that the internal battery, if you ever need them, is going to be charged up fully. Um, I would get um, uh, an FM, FM radio, AM for medium wave is not much used these days in most countries, unless you are in America where it's still pretty, pretty well used. Uh, shortwave as well, just in case the local infrastructure is completely shut, uh, you might be able to hear uh, some shortwave broadcasts from other countries and get some information that way. But also uh, make sure you've got a DAP radio. So uh, DAB is a digital standard. They use different frequencies, different infrastructure. Always bear in mind if one infrastructure goes down, another infrastructure might still be up. So make sure you've got, and you can pick them up for about 10, 20 pounds, cheap DAP radios, DAB radios. Make sure you've got a DAB radio. Okay, I want to stay in touch with people if you know phones go down and everything goes, goes down. Um, um, you need to stay in touch with neighbors uh, and friends and family. So if your friends and family are close by, uh, make sure you've got some, some radio communications. Um, in Europe, uh, you've got the 446 megahertz radios. In Germany, I think there's something called Freenet, which gives you, which is free for you to use and gives you a bit more range. The, um, the 446 megahertz radios, the maximum range is about a kilometer. You've only got about 10, 15 channels there are going to be a lot of people using it. In the States, you've got a Family Radio Service and G GMRS as well. G GMRS, you need a license for, so you have to pay like, is it $50 or something to get a license for a couple of years. Uh, the FRS is free to use. Uh, you get about five kilometers. Uh, also, I mean, something to look into is CB radio. Sort of CB radio equipment has come down in price an awful lot. You can like, you can get fully kitted systems. Um, it'll give you some information, uh, especially if you've got nothing to do and all the comms, everything has gone down. Uh, people will may go back to using CB radio and um, and you could use them. There, there are some very interesting radios about now. Um, a, lot of been, a lot of the stuff has been liberalized, so you've got like a lot of channels you can use. And if... Um, if the conditions are there, you can talk internationally as well. So it's worthwhile to maybe have a CB radio kit uh, somewhere stashed away. Um, cost factor is probably about 100 euros for a decent radio with antenna and, and everything. Um, for four for six radios, you're looking maybe at about 20, 30 pounds for a pair of these radios. Uh, for FRS, GMRS, similar, about you know $50 or something. You can get like a, a set of radios for that. But it'll give you a little bit of, um, you know, communication when all the other communications fails. And it's just something maybe, you know, to keep it mothballed and then get it out if, if you need it. We talked about spare batteries and power packs, so try to get them. If you've got an old car battery, which is uh, not good enough for the car to start the car, there are very often is still some enough life left in them to hook them up to a solar panel, you know, out in the shed or something uh, don't keep them in, in your house um, but um, in a shed or something and um, you can you can have some extra power and if you keep a, a 10 watt solar panel for 10 quid hooked up hooked up to it uh, with um, with a charge controller um, why not you know if it ever comes down to it it's free we don't throw it away 
um, if you give it to a scrap dealer, you get about five pounds or something for the battery, but uh, might be worthwhile to, to keep them there just in case. So the charging facilities, charge controller and inverter. Um, I think I've got some pictures coming up with inverters and charge controllers next, but uh, yeah, go for them, go for them. Uh, it's it's fairly cheap now, and, and I wouldn't go crazy with 100 watt panels or something. They're fairly big, take up a lot of space, but uh, but even little stuff, you know, a couple of 10, 10 watt, 10, 15 watt panels, um, they will work very well. For the Northern Hemisphere, you use monocrystalline, so they, they've got a, a black tint, and they're not quite as uh, sensitive of getting the right angle to, to uh, get full performance out of them. Um, inverters as well, there are two types of inverters. There is um, the, um, the real sine wave inverters and they are very cheap uh, square wave inverters. So they give you 240 volts or 220 volts with a square wave or in America 110 volts. Um, but uh, the, the pure sine wave ones, uh, they're a bit more expensive, probably about two to three times more expensive than the other ones. And you will find that uh, equipment goes a lot better. I, I tried it out once and I tried it out on my central heating system and I started getting um, um, a squealing sound from the electronics and at that point I thought it's not worthwhile to take the risk to, to screw up the uh, electronics and the central heating and that came from uh, not pure square waves going going into the system. So you need to have some filtering, some control uh, before you use it. It's just a word of warning when you, you use this stuff because when you get to a bad event, you don't want uh, you know crucial equipment to fail and not being able to replace it. So get a pure sine wave inverter if you can and you will not regret it. They're a bit more expensive and uh, they're okay. Now, what have I have got here? I've got myself, uh, I've got a couple of inverters. I've got cheap 150 watt inverters and then I've got a 400 and uh, I think a 300 watt inverter and that's pretty much maximum you can you can use anyway because otherwise you drain your batteries really really fast so I just use them for the um, you know in case something goes badly wrong type of event um, also again you know you don't know which infrastructure is still working which infrastructure is going down as far as communications is concerned get yourself a small low power TV which ideally operates on 12 volt uh, and, you know, with a little adapter so you can operate it on 220 volts as well. Uh, so that will give you a chance to, to find out whether there's still some TV programming there. So um, it might be one of the last bits of infrastructure that's still working where you can get information of what's happening. A small, low, a small power TV, if you look on eBay, less than 100, 100 pounds. So it's maybe 40, 50 pounds. Okay, um, emergency radios, uh, you've got a little picture here, you can see what they look like. Uh, so the first one is a crank radio, that's what they look like, they're about you know, 20 pounds or something. The crankshaft actually works, uh, if you, uh, but it's hard work, I tell you that. So if you crank it for about a minute, you do get about 10 minutes, 20 minutes of, of programming. That's a CB radio here, um, together with an antenna, you can pick them up for um, 20 uh, maybe more, but about 50 quid, 50 pounds, 50 to about 100 pounds, a decent radio. Uh, CB two-way radio, that's from left to right, so I'm talking about this one, no, that that one, 446 uh, megahertz PMR radio, that's the one down here. Uh, no, actually this one here, this one is supposed to be the FRS, GMRS, they, they look very similar, they work on similar frequencies as well. This one is for Europe, the FRS, GMRS for Americas. A shortwave radio is down here. Um, if you can get one, get yourself one, um, ideally even one with a crank. So you can use them, you can listen to them, and they work really, really well. Um, so um, to Im improve shortwave reception, just all you need is a piece of wire about four or five meters long, string it up um, away from... Uh, from, uh, you know, lots of concrete or whatever, you know, near a window or something. And you, you do get uh, some decent reception. You can hear stations from all over the world. It's just a matter of scanning around a little bit and looking on the broadcast bands. And then a DAB radio. I've got a really small one, a battery-operated one. 
Uh, and it, it does work. I can charge it up via USB, and it, it works reasonably well. It gives me a few hours of, uh, of listening time. Okay, data. Uh, very, very important. I'm not just talking about internet and stuff like that, but uh, about phone numbers and things like that. You should get a little uh, book where you write all important information in there, maybe encrypted somehow, like if you've got bank account numbers or stuff like that, that you've got a low level encryption on there, like at uh, one to every number or two to every number. So if anybody steals it, that they can't get hold of, um, of sensitive information, same with phone numbers. But um, uh, have phone numbers for friends and family all written in a, in a little booklet, um, bearing in mind your computer might not work. Um, you might not have electricity to get your laptop going. Your phone might not work. And, and I don't know the phone numbers of most of my friends, I have to admit, of heart. They're just stored in my phone. Yeah? But I don't know the physical numbers. So if, you know, if everything breaks down, how do I contact them, even if I have a phone or access to a phone that works? So you should have a, a little booklet where you write down all emergency numbers. And this could be all sorts of stuff. It could be your doctor. It could be um, your, um, uh, your work so that you can inform them what's happening if, you know, if things come back to normal again. Uh, your friends and family, yeah, very important. Then also utility numbers for gas, water, and electricity. Yeah. So, um, you know, if, if you've got no electricity, how do you find out the number for the electricity board? How can you call them to find out what's going on, whether you get some electricity back if it's just a localized disaster? Town services as well. What are the numbers for the, the town? Yeah. So you can inform them that, you know, maybe the road is full of snow. Maybe you're flooded or whatever. Insurance companies as well are very, very important. So try to have your policy numbers and your insurance companies as well. So if your house is totally destroyed and all the data, you know, like your policies are in the house, what are you going to do? So you need to, to have them somewhere. Okay, copy all important documents, store them in the cloud, store them on DVD or CD and have them in some sort of emergency pack with you so that you can access data and get hold of them. And then good old, you know, low, low tech booklet with a pen, you know, go to the pound shop, get yourself a, a biro, like a ball pen and, um, and get yourself a little paper booklet, which you can store somewhere and put it in your emergency rucksack when you leave the house where you've got all the information, important information, policy numbers, um, telephone numbers, and so on stored. And I'm talking to you about this stuff. I still need to do it myself. I got myself a little booklet. I, I've got this, got myself a pen, but I have to spend some time to, to try and put this all out there. Okay, uh, what else have we got? Data, electricity, a petrol generator, very important. There are solar generators as well. They're quite popular now. I've seen them very expensive, but... I've seen them uh, around, and it's it's not a bad idea. It's basically just a big battery, an inverter, uh, charge controller, and uh, solar panels. And they, they tend to have LiPo batteries in there, so they're a bit smaller, a bit more condensed. Um, if you go for batteries, um, I and, and weight is not an issue, I would always say, you know, don't go for LiPo and lithium-ion batteries. Go for deep-cycle lead-acid batteries. Yeah. Leisure batteries, they are, they're called, and um, uh, and they are safer. They're not going to explode on you. They're not going to burn your house down. Um, they're more weighty. That's a problem. Yeah? So they weigh quite a bit, but they're also cheaper, cheaper than some of the lithium-ion stuff that's that's around there. Inverters as well. So inverters, they they take 12 volts in and they give you 240 volts AC out, so you can run you know normal equipment on on them. Um, the problem is if you get like a one, two kilowatt inverter, if you don't use them, they're just idle. They, they draw a lot more current. So it makes sense to have like a 150 watt inverter. I think I've got a couple of 150 watt inverters here. So they're these so-called Coke can size converters. Um, I've got um, a 600 watt uh, one here, I think. And I've got one pure sine wave from one, you know, like a cheap non-pure sine wave ones. Um, and uh, and they, um, I think one is 300 watts, the other one is 600 watts or something. Uh, true sine wave, they are better, but they are more expensive as well. The other thing as well is get a metal bin with emergency electronic equipment, like a, a put spare radios in there and um, 
what else, radios, um, phones, maybe an old uh, cellular phone you've got, and uh, TV, just, just like a range of equipment in case of an EMP. An EMP has not been tested. Nobody really, really knows what's happening, but it could fry uh, transistors and it could fry equipment. So it makes sense to have like... Um, an old metal bin or something where you put a lot of this stuff in so in case of an EMP it'll just bypass it and uh, protect your equipment so that you have it's unlikely you know that it does nobody really knows never been done never been tried there's a lot of theory about uh, but it might make sense especially if you've got old equipment which otherwise you would throw away put them in a metal bin store them somewhere uh, and um, should there be an EMP and all this stuff will happen in a nanosecond, yeah. but your stuff, your equipment could be fried, could be destroyed within a couple of nanoseconds. Uh, but if you've got a metal bin, there's a chance of survival that the equipment is going to survive it. So again, something to bear in mind. Cables adapters to charge batteries from car solar panels as well. So make sure you've got plenty of those, you know, like your charging leads and stuff like that. Buying and selling. So just bear in mind, yeah, no more electricity, no more cash machines, card payments cannot be processed. Uh, so this may mean that we return to a cash society. So diversify your money. So obviously keep some of it on cards if you use cards, but also keep some cash around. Yeah? And, um, and then we can go one step further in case the banks collapse, uh, have some silver and gold as well in small currencies, which can be used for trading. But also have items of trading value. So that this could be food, cigarettes, batteries, tea, chocolate, tools, candles, and so on. So if the whole society breaks down to a level that um, money doesn't work anymore, I mean, you can't eat money, but you can eat food. Food will have a trading value. So it might be, there might be a point that you've got sachets of um, of porridge and um, chocolate and, and other items you know, stored away, which you can use for, for trading for other goods which you need, which you require. Uh, possibly look at gold and silver as an alternative to cash. Um, and um, again, most people haven't got a clue if you come up with a silver coin that it's silver, but it might, <clears throat> you know, if it comes to a, a really bad SHA, <coughs> SHDF event, um, it, it might might work. The main thing is no electricity, no cash machine, no electronic transactions. So the only transaction you can do is just cash. So it, it's worthwhile to... You know, not rely. I know a lot of people who just use their phones for payment now. They use a card for payment. Make sure you've got some cash somewhere stashed away, which you can use in case of, uh, you know, things going going down badly. Okay, protection. That's a biggie as well. So one thing, you know, if services go down, there may not be police, there may not be a fire brigade, there may not be um, uh, an ambulance or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> so you need to protect yourself. Um, a dog is a good idea if you've got a dog just uh, <clears throat> um, keep him happy and keep him keep him keen uh, crowbar broom legal weapons so it depends where you are here in Britain you are very much restricted I think in Germany as well America you've got a much more freedom but on the other side the um, you know the guy who's coming in to rob you uh, might use a gun so you have to do this so that can be um, Simple systems, make sure you've got some a crowbar, broom, you know, as a legal weapon to defend yourself in your home uh, nearby. Simple stuff like sprays, WD-40, paint or whatever, you know, if somebody comes anywhere near you, you can, um, um, you know, defend yourself with that. You can defend yourself with um, high-powered torches, <clears throat> which will blind people momentarily, giving you a chance to get away or get the door closed or shut or get people away from you. Uh, alerts, a fanfare, compressed air horn, battery powered siren, something like that could help as well. So people will freak out, then uh, run away. A thick jacket, helmet, shields might be an idea as well. So if you open the door, somebody's got a, got a knife and they attack you or try to attack you. If you've got a thick jacket uh, and a helmet, it's harder for them to cause any serious damage to you. Good locks as well, so that that's uh, a good idea. Make sure you're protected that way. Windows closes, etc. So it's just some general common sense approach. Mobility as well. Keep your car filled up in likely emergency. <clears throat> so I mean, one thing is if, if you 
like what happened in Russia, you know, if you don't know, you know, are they going to attack or are they not going to attack, you know, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, keep your car filled up in a likely emergency. So don't let the fuel run right down to, you know, empty tanks or only allow your tank to go down to half and otherwise keep it filled up. Have a bicycle um, somewhere around if you can ride one. Uh, just to keep a little bit of mobility. So if you need to get away or you need to get some food or um, <clears throat> you just want to go around, it gives you the edge. So if somebody tries to attack you, you can get away a lot faster. But so it might be an in interesting aspect to keep a bicycle around as well. Have an alternative mode of transport. So have a, a motorbike or a moped, an e-bike and a spare battery, maybe a second car as well, just in case something happens. Um, but otherwise, keep your car maintained, keep it fueled up. Um, have a trailer for car or bicycle so you can move some goods as well. Um, my brother recently bought a trailer for his e-bike and it, it's actually quite surprising what you can get in there. So if you need to move some goods like food or whatever, um, you can you can actually use it for that, especially if you can't get fuel for your car or you don't want to use your car because fuel is too precious. Uh, think about what journeys you're likely to do, like if you've got relatives or dependents further away or vulnerable people you need to attend to. So that will determine as well of how important mobility is going to be. Uh, your car as a means of escape or living. So think about that as well. You know, make sure you've got emergency stuff in your car. Um, if you need to use your car as a means to escape. Or maybe you need to live out of your car because your home has been destroyed, like it happened to Dima. All he had was a car with broken windscreens and broken windows. Um, he patched it back up again and he could take his family to safety in a different town. Okay, entertainment. Just imagine, you know, things have gone down. There's no more television, no more internet. What do you do? How do you keep yourself entertained? Keep books. I mean, I'm a Christian, so keep your Bible around. Maybe Kindle or ebook, iPod with talks and lectures and music. Just think about how can you, um, you know, kill 24 hours a day um, to uh, survive, keep going. Games for children, maybe, if you've got children about, if you've got hobby activities, uh, which you can engage in to keep your mind off the dire situation uh, the world has come into. So look at hobby activities, maybe films and videos on USB. So again, stop your reliance on the internet. Download, you know, podcasts, talks. Uh, maybe, you know, have an iPod as well, which doesn't take a lot of electricity. Think about these audio devices and uh, put talks and music and lectures, whatever, whatever is of interest to you and download them and um, maybe put them on there so you can watch them and keep yourself entertained. Okay, strategy. Um, <clears throat> when it happens, uh, finish fresh foods first and look at refrigerated foods then at frozen foods if no electricity is available. So your fridge is not going to last very long. Yeah. So if you, you've got a power cut and you've got a good reasonable uh, freezer, the freezer is going to keep cold depending on what the outside temperatures is for quite some time. Yeah. So food is not going to spoil overnight, but uh, you may have maybe a couple of days, but then you know, as it starts thawing, start using up uh, foods which you've got in your freezer. Um, right. I'm just uh, looking at my talk. I need to come to an end very quickly because I've got other stuff to do. I've got a sense of urgency to try to get this talk out. Um, and uh, we are getting there closely. So anyway, um, Get water stored as long as it is available. So if your tap is still running, you know, fill up your bathtub, you know, get all the empty bottles and everything you have and put uh, water in there. Uh, make sure you, you have empty bottles or you have got storage facilities for water as well. There's lots of camping equipment you can buy and some of the stuff is fairly cheap and it's got like a, you know, de facto tap on front of it as well and you can put like 20 liters or something in there. So get the things and start using um, water. If you get like mineral water, sometimes you can buy them in five liter or gallon bottles. And uh, and again, you can you can use them. Think about water filtration. Uh, secure your home as best as possible. You know, keep lights on, close doors, keep them locked. Um, 
check on neighbors and family and friends, make sure they are okay, try and establish a local network and a community for mutual protection and care. So that's very, very important. Uh, don't be an island by yourself, but make sure um, that your neighbors know that you're okay and that you know that your neighbors are okay. And also, and this is maybe part of prepping as well, the benevolent side where you've got plenty of food so you can give to you know people who are in your local network and make sure that they are okay. And it's a little bit, you know, you, you look after them, so you make sure they look after you if, if, if ever needs be. And that is the end of the presentation. Hope this uh, <clears throat> this gave you a little bit of uh, an inspiration of what to do. Ultimately, you know, the main point is, and, and I'm a Christian, I'm talking from a Christian perspective, um, you need to to be in a good relationship with God. You need to be sensitive to what God is saying. And um, if you get the, the the you know the sense in your spirit and your in your in your in your heart to you need to go, you need to move, you need to do X Y Z, then do X Y Z to try and prepare yourself. And it's not just about you as well; it's about um, your wife, your husband, uh, your children as well, about your parents, dependents you have got, you know, vulnerable people, your your, your community around you, you know, where you live possibly people within your church you need to look after. Try and make sure that, uh, that um, number one, is you're sensitive to, to that. If you're not a Christian, I would recommend to you to become a Christian as fast as possible and to uh, give your life to Jesus Christ. Um, the concept is very easy. The gospel in a nutshell is we are all sinners. We are not right before God. And therefore, you know, there seems to be a big barrier between us and God. We need to get this barrier away, and this is number one um, repentance to get away from the stuff that is not right before God. Um, you know, to to try we can't live a righteous life on our on ourselves, but to be willing to live a righteous life and to surrender your um, your you know your life to to Jesus Christ, to put your trust in Jesus Christ that He has paid for all the sins you you have committed in your in your life and uh, that he is paid for with his blood. And by you putting your trust in Jesus Christ, you can, number one, be washed clean as far as God is concerned. So all your sin is being atoned for, all your sin is being dealt with. And then number two is you can enter into a relationship with God, which is very important. And from then on, you can walk with God and you can uh, endeavor to live a life that is good and right before God. We will, never, we will never achieve it, but we need to try. We need to try and go on this route. Okay, that's all. Uh, you're listening to um, Seismic Radio. My name is Michael, and uh, thank you for, for listening to this. Hope this has been of some help. Uh, God bless and bye-bye from Michael here at Seismic Radio.